My goal is in 25 minutes, which is, goes by fairly quickly uh, with the topic, is to kind of help you see why we are where we are with uh, container runtimes, um, demystify some terms like OCI and CRI, and uh, hopefully make that at least a little bit informative and, and not just uh, a bunch of boring information. Um, and so we'll see, see how we do on that. So clearly, um, even though uh, those of you who are uh, maybe have a deeper layer of understanding about what, it, what we even call containers, that they're made up of C groups and namespaces, and, and that these concepts and, and technologies have existed quite a while before Docker. So for example, some of the namespaces in the Linux kernel have been there for over a decade. But I think we can all agree that it was Docker in 2014, 2015, coming on the stage and sort of exciting the developer's mind with the simplicity of some of these commands you see on the screen. That all of a sudden I, I just type docker run and some sort of standard uh, open source software package like Redis or MySQL or Apache or Nginx. And in less than, you know, 500 milliseconds, this service is running. And that was magical for, for lots of developers. Um, and so that's kind of become synonymous with containers uh, in the last four or five years. But that doesn't mean that Docker is the only container runtime. In fact, soon after Docker came on the scene, CoreOS had some uh, other ideas about um, how to actually connect a developer with some of those features in the Linux kernel, the same features built around the same namespaces and C groups. Uh, but they came out with Rocket with some, some new ideas. Since then, uh, Container D, Creo, there was, a, there was a, a great talk in here earlier about Cata. We'll talk about sandbox and isolation a little bit later in the talk. Uh, but even Cloud Foundry, uh, and there were some talks that referred to Cloud Foundry here earlier today. Cloud Foundry under the covers was packaging up and using these same features uh, below their, um, their platform as a service model to run containers as well. And even stepping away from kind of this Docker application model, LXC and LXD have been around, uh, produced by uh, Canonical and a team there uh, for a number of years. And the high-performance computing space has also been interested in containers with tools like Singularity and some others. And so in this um, kind of explosion of, of runtimes and, and ideas for how to use containers, um, obviously the, the market didn't want there to be a hundred different ideas of what it meant to be a container, or how to run a container, or how to create a container image. And so that's really how the OCI was born, was this idea, could we all get together, and even if there are different runtimes that exist and different ways of building and running containers, could we all agree on a specification for what that means to have a, a runtime and an image format and how to distribute those images? And so, uh, Many of us uh, got together and were involved in founding that in 2015. Uh, many member companies have joined since. And out of that has come a runtime spec, uh, which is at a 1.0 release since uh, the middle of 2017. Um, a implementation of that called RunC that many of you have heard of. You know that, you know, at least you probably know that when you run Docker, that talks to Container D and Container D drives RunC. And also an image format. Uh, that has then led to the distribution spec. So how do I talk to a registry? And so Docker obviously had a, uh, a way to do that, uh, that many people again use Docker pull, Docker push. These are registry operations. And so now that is also uh, part of the OCI and we're hoping to finalize the 1.0 version of the distribution spec uh, next year. So again, the idea bring all these communities together to an agreement on what it means um, to have a image, what it means to run a container, and then people can go different directions and as long as they're OCI compliant, we can actually have um, interoperability among many, many different tools. And so I would say, um, you know, in the years that have followed, uh, we're in a pretty good place with this common substrate of container runtimes and container registries that are meeting these OCI specs and the specs that are in process. And these drive how we actually run containers on Linux and also Microsoft 
is involved and, and, and the OCI specs also uh, provide a way to talk about how we run containers on Windows. And so you can think of that kind of uh, bubbling up to, again, this mix of runtimes, whether we're talking about CATA containers or Nabbler, ContainerD or Docker or Creo. And then, of course, there are many, many different registries. There are some in the CNCF, like Project Harbor. Docker Hub is an instance of an open source project called Docker Distribution. Um, all the major cloud providers have registries. Some of them uh, have been written themselves. Uh, JFrog has, has a registry. Um, Quay.io is recently open sourced. So again, we're at this place where, thankfully, you as a developer or an operator, you don't have to worry about whether your developers are using Docker or ContainerD or Creo or whether they're playing around with uh, CATA containers or AWS Firecracker. We can actually interoperate, you know, your container image in Docker Hub can also be pushed to Quay. It can also be pushed to Azure's or IBM Cloud Registry. And so that's a great place, and that's really uh, what we intended to do with the OCI when we started in 2015. But just to give you uh, a little taste that we aren't done yet, we'd, we'd like to see more areas sort of standardized and finalized things that are in process. There's some great works around artifacts that was added to the OCI uh, this year. So the idea that you don't just have to store layers and image configs and registries, Maybe you'd like to store Helm charts or, or CNAB, like the other talk that's, that's going on right now. Or maybe you'd like to um, include a bill of materials, like the SPDX format. So there's some great work about defining sort of standard media types and how registries would implement understanding them, searching them. Like I said, we'd like to finish the distribution spec this year. There's a lot of Im interest in image signing, so security in Kubernetes and containers is a hot topic. And so there's a set of, of registry operators who would like to say it'd be nice, uh, we have these CNCF projects, Notary, Tough, um, and uh, Red Hat also has a PGP-based signing process. So I, I believe there was actually a meeting yesterday uh, on, in US time that I wasn't able to attend to kind of kick off this new topic about image signing and see if we, if we can agree on what it looks like to sign an image. Run C uh, 1.0 is finally uh, finishing up. Like I said, the distribution spec, uh, what comes after one, so kind of one plus. And then a lot of new ideas have been presented in the last year about container images. Have we picked the best model for how we create these tarballs of layers? And so there's a lot of great information if you go searching on sort of OCI v2, which is not an official name of any kind of spec, but just kind of a moniker for those discussions. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour of OCI, why it was created, what it's done, what we're still trying to do. Let's turn our attention to Kubernetes. So um, you probably know this, but just in case you don't, Kubernetes has never had a runtime in Kubernetes itself. It doesn't know how to run containers. It's an orchestrator, and it's always relied on some container runtime to do the work of actually running your containers. Since the earliest days of Kubernetes, that was Docker via this uh, Docker shim uh, code, which you can still find if you go out on GitHub, uh, poke down in the Kubernetes code base, you can find the Docker shim code that drives the Docker engine to do things like when you start a pod, Docker has to actually start that container, has to uh, interact with the kubelet about op uh, statistics, operations like stopping, uh, removing, et cetera pulling images from the registry. And so again, this is kind of uh, where we were. Um, again, as other runtimes appeared on the scene, um, there were variants of this, like Rocket Netties, uh, to use Rocket as the runtime. But as the idea of more runtimes uh, were kind of on the horizon, it was clear that it wasn't gonna be feasible to keep kind of integrating code with the kubelet and container runtimes and sort of having this mess of, of different code bases and, and trees for different runtimes. And so the CRI interface, the container runtime interface, was announced in late 2016 as a way to abstract out the idea of a container runtime and how it interfaces to Kubernetes. So a set of responsibilities defined by the CRI API 
would be given. And if you were a runtime and wanted to plug into Kubernetes, all you have to do is respond to those CRI API calls, start, stop, remove, pull image, et cetera. And you can go read up on sort of that whole interface spec. And there again, continues to be uh, growth there and changes over time as new features are requested for how Kubernetes interacts and what kind of information needs to be shared between Kubernetes and runtimes. So kind of the current landscape today of who is actually Im implementing this interface. Uh, obviously Docker continues to be um, somewhat of a, a default. Many people still use the Docker engine. Docker shim is sort of grandfathered in. It's not a real sort of CRI implementation, but when we talk about uh, Kubernetes using runtimes, it makes sense for us to list it. But CRI and Creo are kind of the, the major implementers of the CRI today. I also break out uh, Container D to show that you can run other isolators underneath Container D. You can also do some of these under Creo simply by just replacing run C with other binaries. Uh, but Container D developed a shim API uh, so that there could actually be sort of a richer uh, level of, of communication between uh, the runtime and these isolators like Kata or Firecracker or Google's Gvisor. Singularity, which I mentioned, uh, maybe you haven't heard of it uh, from the high performance computing space. Uh, they created a runtime specific to the needs of uh, HPC cluster workloads. Uh, but over time, they added OCI compliance. And then more recently last year, they added an implementation of the CRI that again, if you wanted a Kubernetes cluster in an HPC environment and your choice was singularity, you can now actually plug that into a Kubernetes cluster and that will drive singularity to do those operations on containers. If you were creating your own cluster, the way you would do this sort of, if you're following Kelsey Hightower's um, Kubernetes the hard way, when you start the kubelet, you can actually point it at a runtime, point it to the socket that's gonna actually respond to the CRI API um, and then we don't have a ton of time uh, to go into runtime class, but that's a feature uh, slightly newer that then allows you to actually register runtimes with Kubernetes and, and use that as a, a way like in your pod spec to say, actually, I would like this pod run with this runtime. And then you can interface with Containerd, for example, to uh, place a specific workload on Firecracker or Kata or Gvisor. So that's kind of the, the path to using different um, runtimes within Kubernetes. Obviously, if you're using a managed service from one of the cloud providers, if your company's operations team is running your clusters, they're gonna make this choice for you and you're gonna default to whatever runtime that they choose for your needs. So kind of where we are today, um, Sysdig just put out a report, I think within the last month or so, uh, and this was a graphic that they added to that report, which has uh, a little more detail sort of textually if you want to follow through to this link, uh, you can read more about it. But not totally unexpected that again, Docker has been the default runtime under so many um, clusters uh, operated and, and in production today that, that as you would expect, Docker is the lion's share of uh, results in their survey. Container D up to 18% and Creo at 4% and growing. Again, Creo has become the default in Red Hat's uh, OpenShift. And so you can expect that that, that number will grow as well. Um, so we, we put out a blog post early last year just talking about our work to integrate Container D. So I'm a maintainer in the CNCF Container D project. And so uh, you can read more about our work to bring that to GA. And that's led to uh, IBM's managed Kubernetes service using Containerd as a runtime. Uh, GKE has it as an option. And then last week at AWS reInvent, uh, Amazon announced um, that they were using Containerd with, uh, as the default runtime for Fargate. And so we see, again, a lot of movement in the space as people uh, make other choices than sort of defaulting to Docker. And so it'll be interesting in a year to see uh, where this goes. Now in 25 minutes, it's really um, almost impossible to kind of detail why would I choose? If, if it was up to me, if I was creating the clusters, why would I choose different runtimes? 
there's obviously maybe a myriad of, of choices around performance or stability, extensibility. Um, maybe you're really interested in your runtime being directly compatible to a Kubernetes release, and so the Creo team uh, has made that kind of a, a tenant of uh, how they exist. So Creo 1.16, you know for sure that was tested fully end-to-end -end and passes all the suites for Kubernetes 1.16. Maybe you're interested in additional isolation like Kata, Nabla, Gvisor, et cetera, et cetera. I did uh, try and sort of answer these questions in a, a talk at uh, KubeCon San Diego uh, last month. So you can watch that or, or see the slides as well uh, if you want to dig deeper into that topic. I would like to highlight that there is increased interest in this whole idea of maybe default container isolation isn't enough for my workloads, for my threat models. And so there's a lot of people in the security community talking about this, such as this tweet that came out around uh, KubeCon last month. And again, it was an area, I, because I've worked in run times, I've been interested to see sort of the announcements and the, the rollouts of, of different uh, use cases. And if you were in this room a few hours ago, um, Atlassian talked about their use of Kata, which was quite interesting, um, as a additional isolation layer in their pipelines capability. So I wrote an article in InfoQ, published in October. Again, a lot more detail about why are people interested in sandboxes, who's using them, and kind of where, where they might be going from here. So the, the good news is, no matter who's choosing a runtime, um, there's, a, there's a way to interface with it that doesn't uh, rely on your operators having to know the, the client tooling or the specifics of a specific runtime. And so that tool is called CRI CTL. And so um, if your cloud provider uh, creates you a, a Kubernetes cluster and gives you access to a worker node, hopefully you'd be able to find this command and you could start talking directly to the CRI socket uh, for your runtime. So no matter if that's Docker, Creo, Containerd, you can do things that sort of feel natural, things you'd expect to do, like PS commands. Uh, there's some sort of special commands with extra characters, like stop P for stop a pod versus stop a container, removing, pulling images, listing images. So again, this is a way for uh, your operators to, again, abstract away from this idea that we have to know exactly uh, the runtime. And so you can read, there's a, a user guide, the CRI team for Containerd put together, and obviously the, the code for that is within Kubernetes. Um, so I think, you know, summarizing what I hope uh, to, have, to have shared is that the OCI was a really valuable step in kind of this explosion of interest in the container ecosystem to have a level playing field so that we're not all fighting each other with different tool choices that mean we can't work together. So uh, the fact that, that as of you know, these last few years that, that we don't have to worry about whether our developers are using the same exact runtime as our operations or production team, and these higher la layer uh, as abstractions can have real interoperability that, that's been proven and the fact that we got all the right people together to collaborate and, and put that together um, hopefully means we've delivered on kind of maybe making the runtime space boring after all the talk of sort of the container runtime wars of, of 2015. Another, I think, sort of side effect, which I'll, I call the network effect, of having this, this uh, positive peer pressure to be OCI compliant is that the LXC team and the um, Singularity team added OCI compatibility to their runtimes, which are not necessarily Docker-like. Um, and so that, that was great to see that the expectation is that in the container ecosystem, OCI uh, compliance is valuable and useful for users. And so add to that the CRI, and we really have gotten to the place where sort of pluggability with your Kubernetes cluster is a reality. Um, and again, we can hear from other talks that people are actually using these features, they're actually doing this and implementing this. Again, whenever we, uh, I think some things that are still in progress, 
choice is always confusing um, because people want to know why. What should I choose? Just tell me the right answer. And that's not always easy in a world where there's lots of choices. And so um, one of the reasons I give this talk and hopefully uh, others are sharing their experiences is so people have some data and some information to make these choices themselves. And so it doesn't become just a, a, a crazy set of choices and, and confusing decisions. So hopefully we're helping users make those choices to determine, you know, do I need sandboxing isolation like GVisor or CATA? Are the default runtimes good enough for my use cases? What are the threat models? And, and again, there's a lot going on in the security space in Kubernetes to try and help people figure those things out. I think also in a world where a lot of this is still maturing is obviously companies do like common tooling choices. Enterprises like to know that people are sort of all using a standardized thing. So in a world where we're seeing a lot of Docker migration to other, uh, other tools and, and other um, platforms, you know, where, where do we send people for this kind of Docker run use case that everyone has sort of accepted over the years? And then finally, as I tried to hint at, I think um, we're trying to keep momentum in the OCI for challenges that still exist, things that are still of interest uh, to users to standardize so that, for example, we don't have a myriad of choices if I use Azure's registry or IBM Cloud or Google that we have different ways to sign images or to verify or validate images. And so hopefully the OCI uh, will continue on being a valuable place where we have those discussions, figure out a common path forward, and, and make this uh, straightforward for users and operators uh, to continue um, using these valuable tools. So with that, that's what I wanted to share uh, today. We have uh, two and a half minutes officially on the clock but it's also break time uh, in a few minutes, so I'm happy to answer questions here. I'm happy just to, uh, to hang around. So anyone have a burning question before we officially close? And I can barely see, but I'm happy to um, pass the mic if, if so. And I think people are maybe more interested in break than questions. So let's end there, and uh, thanks very much for listening. <laughs>